Hello, guys. Sorry about that. We had a little technical mess up. So we'll just let everyone start to filter in. Hello, hello. I found it. That was really weird. My It just, it's like, did not exist on my phone. I know. Like I was in here. I know. I was in here waiting. I was like, no one's joining. This. I was in the one that was pre-scheduled. I think this happened to um, the first speaker as well before because she was in there and it lasted a few minutes and no one joined. But here we go. We're all good. Hmm. Um, okay, sweet. Here we go. The Mercs are back. It's been a little while. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, sorry about that. Uh, Kunai, are you going to monitor from your personal account or from the KazimiCon account? I will just chill here on my personal account. If that's yeah, okay. that's fine with us. Okay. Or- Alrighty. So, how is everybody doing today? Good, I hope. Um, happy Venus Day. Happy Venus Kazemi. Um, so happy to be here. So happy that everybody is here with us. So, um, just to kind of introduce what we'll be doing today, um, we're going to go through a passage that was translated by Laszlo Um, with the Heroi Project, and it is a segment of Rhetorius the Egyptian's work discussing the step-by-step interpretation of a natal chart. All of the boxes you should check when you go to interpret. Yeah, so this is a really valuable, um, you know, excerpt that we have remaining from Rhetorius that wasn't actually included in the compendium from the translation that Holden did. So if you've seen, like, the copy of the translation called like Rhetorius the Egyptian. It's like brown and gold or yellowish. It doesn't actually have this passage in there. So this was from a separate manuscript that Levant um, found. And the whole thing with this is it's, we're not going to get super into uh, like the history of these manuscripts because it's really um, complex and like way over the scope of what we're talking about right now. So we're actually going to have this segue a little bit today into what Stella and I are going to announce as our next series that we're doing um, for our podcast. So actually, everything today is going to be like a brief kind of overview of what we're going to be doing when we actually go through and read Rhetorius together um, on YouTube. We're going to do live streams. So we're, this is just the beginning of a whole discussion and journey and kind of talking about Rhetorius's writings but yeah, basically, we have this extant, multiple extant versions of this text, and you can see the link that is um, going to be posted on the Jumbotron any moment here. Um, but we're going to be, you're basically going to see three different lines of text, and we're going to be reading version one today. We're just going to be reading version one. Um, yes. And for just a little bit of context with that as well, um, version one is dated to be the oldest one. Um, There are possibly more complete versions of this that happened later on. That's why you'll notice the different passages have different links and stuff like that. But as Cam mentioned, um, the history is very complex and some of the things have been kind of supplemented. They're still trying to smooth out exactly what happened with these documents. But the one on the left is that they're most certain about. Yeah, basically the other ones have been like kind of translated and found from later authors, from like the um, later in the 800s, I believe. And then another one is from the, like, the almost around the year 1000. And they're all coming from this version one, which is believed to be the one... Uh, attributed to uh, Rhetorius, um, although the actual explanation of or the compendium that you like have seen maybe online from Holden's translation, Levon actually thinks that this was not um, Rhetorius. Thinks this was actually um, should be attributed to another astrologer who was working um, for Emperor Zeno in the Byzantine period. Um, so. This text, he we are attributing to Rhetorius um, along the lines of how um, uh, Levant Laszlo's has been reconstructing and kind of organizing all these manuscripts that we have left. So we're going to be going off of that version one, which will be on the left column. So yeah, I'm pretty sure um, that's uh, most of the stuff we wanted to talk about. Um, 
anything else before we get into reading it? I would just like to add, um, for just a little bit of historical context, Pretorius was one of the latest Hellenistic astrologers. So he has a lot of complete works, um, summaries. He draws from other authors very visibly. Um, and so just worth mentioning that he is from the later Hellenistic era. Right. Yeah. So and with Rhetorius, it's a whole thing. And this is why we're going to kind of abstain from getting into it, because it's Rhetorius gives like presents kind of one of the more complex um, histories of tracing down the like the lineage of these texts. So we're going to dive into that in the podcast. But yeah, for today, all we have to really be aware of is that this was like a, basically a text from the late Hellenistic period, um, basically around the 400, 500 range. And yeah, we're going to get into the systematic interpretation of nativities. So yeah, everyone, I have the link shared on the Jumbotron. So this is a free PDF that's been shared. Um, this is coming from the translation that was published onto Chris's website, HellenisticAstrology.com. I think there's a few in circulation that have maybe variations in some of the translations, but we're just going to, um, yeah, we're just going to go over the one that's attached there, and we're just reading version one. Okay, so Stella, do you want to start us off? Yeah, I would love to. Okay. All righty. So, it begins with... After you have ascertained the positions of the stars to the degree, the natures of their signs, their bounds according to their Egyptians, their trigons, participations, exaltations and oppressions, their decans and the faces of these decans, their individual degrees and bright degrees, their twelfth parts, latitudes in reference to the winds and the steps, their obliques, and their distance from, that is, their distance from the ecliptic, just as from the meridian, their appearances, additions, well, or Do you want to pause there for now, because we're, we're going to go back through all this. Okay. Yes. So, we'll, so... We'll, we'll just give our first pause here. So, we're getting a huge list of basically, you know, finding the planets to the degree, and then assessing their zodiacal condition. Um, so, like, the first ones that he lists is the nature of the signs, so everyone, the first thing you really learn when you hear about where your planets are is what sign it's in. And we mm -hmm. start kind of describing planets based off of that archetypal nature of the zodiacal sign it's resident in. Yes. And then um, the Egyptian bounds, um, the subdivisions also, of the zodiac. I was just going to say, also interesting he lists those next, you know. Right, right. It is very interesting, especially um, like when you hear that a lot of Hellenistic astrologers attribute the bound lord of a planet to a planet in its own bound to be as powerful as a planet in its own domicile. That, yeah, I know. That is really intriguing. And the other thing it makes me think of, too, is just how intrinsically connected the bounds are to like the length of life, which is what we'll talk about in the next few pages. But it's also interesting because in the horoscopes that were just uncovered from Athrobus, um, this, or just that um, Esco, uh, es Paulina Ascoba, I believe her name is, uh, published a paper on these horoscopes from like literally once first century BC. They listed the degrees of the planets and their bound lords. So the bounds since like even before Valens, before Ptolemy, before Antiochus, like BC, we have remnants of horoscopes that were tracking just the degrees and then they wrote the bound lord. So the bounds have always been intrinsically a part of assessing a planet's condition. It's really interesting. Yeah, and I mean, it's a fundamental piece of the zodiac, you mm -hmm. know? Like, it's something that is ingrained into the zodiac itself. So it's very fascinating that it's so fundamental with the practice as well. Yeah, Um and so he says they're trigons. And then the next word after the trigon, so of course the, the triplicity lords, which some of you are familiar with, maybe um, like the third classical level of dignity, of essential dignity um, that was used from the Hellenistic period onward. Um, and once again, we, like today, we're just kind of going over all these items. So we're going to be going over this whole winter, how to do these things. This is just like grab your pen and paper, maybe take some notes on what this whole list of things are. 
and maybe some of like our commentary about it, but we can't really talk about all these things individually. So we do have to kind of move a little bit quickly through a lot of these because it's already 312. So, but I do want to just mention really quickly the next word, the participations. Um, yeah. Because this is an interesting concept that has come up in a few different translations. We have references in like Porphyry to the concept of joint possession. In Rhetorius, it's, um, I believe, the same idea, joint possession. In Antiochus, it's called, Schmidt translated it as participation, but also communion. And mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about the main idea with that that concept? Sure, yeah. I mean, communion comes from the Latin, from a Latin word, uh, communion, something like that. And it just means fellowship, mutual participation, sharing. Um, it's not communion as in like ritual scraps that you have at church. It's like communion, more like community. So, yeah. And um, that's kind of this idea that you get with par- participations here. Right. So the Greek word is mates okay. And basically the definitions we get, we get a few varying ones. And some of them are really bizarre. And the um, the first footnote that you'll see, the number, the first one that's on the bottom, um, he talks about this really kind of bizarre one that we see from like a second or third century papyrus where they're associating like Saturn with Capricorn, Taurus, and Aquarius, with Mars and Leo, and Jupiter and Scorpio. And he says the logic of the system remains unclear in the absence of its description. So we have that kind of remnant of this definition, which we really don't understand. But then we also have like bits and pieces of other authors that refer to a similar idea um, as Antiochus, which is basically um, when you have two planets that are both in charge of the same sign. So for instance, with Cancer, the domicile lord is the moon, the exaltation lord is Jupiter. If you have the moon and Jupiter together in a sign that witnesses Cancer, they're said to be in like joint possession or participation of that sign. And they basically have a mutual interest in tending to this other place of the zodiac. So the whole idea with the participation is really just like you want to be looking at these multiple levels of essential dignity and how planets are working together to tend to another place and that there is a joint possession by those multiple planets. Right. How can you participate to help bring about the natal signification of this sign, this planet, this part of the zodiac? Mm -hmm. And then do you want to keep reading a little bit the next ones? Yeah. Yeah. Um, And then it goes into the exaltations and depressions. So um, now we're looking at exalted and fallen planets or domicile and otherwise. There are decans and the faces of these decans. So another subdivision of the zodiac, um, one of the less prevalent forms of like minor dignity, I guess. I guess it's essential dignity, but a minor form of it. And then there are individual degrees and Mm. right degree. So this is the idea that a planet will be fueled by a star more so than if it is on a degree of the ecliptic that is just black night. Mm -hmm. So if there is no fixed star there, the planet does not have that additional bit of jet fuel. Mm. And I'm just going to read really quickly an excerpt from Demetra George's first volume, page 226, in the chapter on the Deccans, where she says, the full and empty degrees, or like we can also call them the bright and dark degrees, or you may have heard of the wells, which are also that kind of similar concept of an empty degree. The full and empty degrees of the zodiac are another way that Deccans were used in interpretation. This is part of the secret doctrine alluded to by Firmicus Maternus. While there exist three 10-degree segments in each sign, the divinity of the decanic power does not extend uniformly throughout all the degrees of each decan. The exact stellar position of each decan star or star set inhabits certain degrees. These are called the full degrees because they contain a decanic star. The degrees that do not contain a decanic star or star set are called empty degrees, to which the degrees of divinity of the decans never comes. So they associated these decans with stellar powers, but just because you have a planet in its own decan, um, or a planet in any decan for that matter, it might not exhibit the sort of celestial or divine attributes that you give to that face. So the Mars and Capricorn Deccan, you might might have a planet in there, but if it's not in the range of three to four to five bright degrees of the fixed star that was given the divinity of that celestial power, it might not exhibit it in the natal chart or in your life. 
Um, and then, yes. Yeah, I know that was, that was a lot, but that's basically the <laughs> idea with these degrees. And then it goes into their 12 parts, which, Cam, this is your cup of tea. If you want to know more about the 12 parts, make sure you listen to Cam's lecture coming up. Um, and then their latitudes and reference to the winds and the steps. Do you want to take that one? Yeah, like this word they use a lot when they talk about the winds. And basically, we just have to think about back in the day when they talked about directions, they usually used the terminology of the winds to equate to the directions. And so what they're actually talking about here, because when we're thinking about latitude, latitude is about um, northern or southern um, you know, not necessarily declination, that's a little different, but latitude is about measuring something's distance relative north or south to the ecliptic. So the winds actually means like northern, if they say like northern wind, it means like a northern latitude from the ecliptic and southern wind would be like a southern latitude. And this is also something they used in like delineating a planet's sect status. So if it was north of the ecliptic, it would be given another masculine kind of rejoicing condition. And if it was southern, it would be slightly feminized. Yes, and um, something fascinating about this that I think that I'm still trying to figure out if it's true, um, because the wind patterns change so drastically, whether like the further north or south you are on the planet, if you are north of the equator or south of the equator, um, you get this drastic shift in wind direction and things like that. So i I'm trying to figure out if that's like a direct link to that. That's kind of what it's alluding to. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's it, uh, some of the, sometimes they use the same word and they are referring to different things. So it's sometimes it's a little unclear. Um, and that's, that's also kind of goes to be said for not all, but like a lot of this, you know, it's like difficult to really reconstruct right. and understand everything that they're talking about. But, you know, we have a decent idea with here that they're basically talking about Northern or Southern. Um, you know, refer in reference to the ecliptic. Yeah. Um, and then and you then, can keep going. I was going to say, you can read this part. I feel like I've read so much of this passage. Okay. Um, so then he goes on to say, their appearances, additions, or subtractions, or stationing. So now he's talking a little... Their obliquities. Oh, sorry. sorry. I'm, I'm, I keep looking. I have a printed version. I mentioned earlier there's multiple extant translation that Laszlo made. I need to look at the one everyone has. I'm so sorry. Okay. No worries. There are appearances, additions, or subtractions, or stationing. Um, so here he's talking about solar phases. So now we've kind of moved on a little bit from, you know, we looked at the zodiacal condition, looking at individual degrees, 12 parts, and then we looked at the latitude, north or south of the ecliptic, and now he's talking about solar phases. So this is going to be about an appearance would be making a helical rise, um, you know, emerging from 15 degrees from the sun. Um, additions or subtractions. This can be a little confusing. Sometimes you might see it additive in numbers or subtractive in numbers. And what this is referring to is direct or retrograde motion. So if a planet is direct, it's adding its numbers, it's getting in higher degrees. And then if it's like subtractive, what that means is it's moving in retrograde motion. So the numbers are decreasing, getting smaller. Right. And is this planet combust as mm -hmm. well? Like, can we even see it? Right. Yeah. And then it proceeds with, and according to the degree, the co-risings of the fixed stars that are close to them with reference to their magnitude, winds, and temperaments. Mm -hmm. And so this is talking about like, Parans, the co-risings of fixed stars that are close to them, um, with reference to magnitude, winds, and temperament. So how bright is the star? Is this star the nature of the sun and Mars? You know, things like mm -hmm. that. And the wind. And winds again. Yeah. Just like we have, um, oh, geez, you know, there's like 36 extra zodiacal constellations. So other constellations they looked at that aren't any of the 12 on the zodiac. So some of them are northern and some of them are southern. So they were looking and just paying attention to, well, you know, is this fixed star that it's rising with north of the ecliptic or south? Um, yeah, and it's interesting, too, that he's talking about Parans. You know, you don't hear a lot about them, but he's saying, you know, decently, you know, early on within the description of what we need to look at here to pay attention to 
you know, basically stars that co-rise with the planets, which that idea might be unfamiliar to some people here. So maybe we can explain that one really quickly. Um, a paran is short for the Greek word paranatalanta, which basically means co-rising. And basically, just think about going outside at night and watching a planet rise on the horizon. In that exact moment, when you're looking at it come over, you know, from underneath the Earth, you pay attention to that exact instant. Is there another fixed star exactly on the horizon in any location, like around the entire 360 degrees of the sphere? Is any other star rising, setting, or also on the exact degree of the midheaven or icy? So is anything culminating or anti-culminating? And so when you have a planet that's exactly on any angle, actually, at the same exact instant that another star is on any other angle, they sort of merge their influences together. It's kind of interesting. Yes. Um, but it's hard to visualize, and it's also a little bit, it's definitely a kind of a more niche thing within this, so we can't dwell too much on it, but we'll definitely get into t parans and explaining the astronomy and interpretive qualities of using them eventually. No, definitely. And as with like anything that comes up here, if we talk about anything and you're like, what? Like, keep in mind, like, if you are interested, the Mercuranians will be talking about it through Retorius as well. So it's kind of just like we're kind of teasing a little bit because we're talking about like all this cool stuff. And it's like, at least now you guys, like we have a source that you guys can have and read from to see, well, okay, well, like what really are all those things they look at? So, you know, and of course, you can right. always do your own research, but we are, of course, going to be actually going through all this stuff later. So, yeah. And, you know, we could spend two hours talking about I know, brands. yeah, it would be, yeah. <laughs> so, as it continues, um, it goes, then come to the hour marker and the midheaven and the pivots, succeedance, and declines to the degree. Mm. To the degree is very fascinating here because he is talking about quadrant houses. Mm, yeah, this is, um, he's not referencing just casting the ascendant and the midheaven. We're talking here specifically about getting a degree for each house, which means he's calculating a form of quadrant house division. Um, now there's some debate about which system he was using and actually which, um, how early it came from. So, we have most scholars assuming that, assuming and agreeing on generally that, and um, sorry, Rhetorius was using Alcabicius houses, which are, that name is actually attributed to Alcabisi, who was a medieval astrologer, but Rhetorius was using um, basically the same formulation that calc would calculate it the same way, even though they've been attributed to Alcabisi. Although some people say Rhetorius was the first one to expose this form of house division, Schmidt thinks that it was originally proposed by, I believe, a third medical astrologer who, um, whose name I can't remember right now, but it was a pretty obscure name. Um, so yeah, we're basically assuming he's talking about calculating some form of alcabicious houses here. And, I mean, Rhetorius is pretty articulate with, a, or, and this is pretty articulate, with a lot of the things that we are seeing. Also, if we have time at the end, I'm um, sorry about this, just gonna say that let's please save questions for the end. So if you would like to speak, please just save your yeah, questions. Yeah, we're gonna try to leave like 10, five to 10 minutes. So hopefully we can address yes. the questions at that point. And, um, but yeah, so, um, Rhetorius is pretty articulate. I mean, look at this humongous sentence going on here. This has all been one sentence, mm -hmm. right? We we have yet to see a period, yeah. and or we've only seen yeah. one. I the Greek guys like to do that. <laughs> yeah, and so like if he was calculating with porphyry or something, he would likely give some kind of allusion to that instead of saying calculate them all to the degree. It would be calculate the hour marker which is the ascendant um in case that was unclear and the midheaven and divide the categories then take those divisions and blah 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 do you get what i'm yeah. saying yeah i mean so, it's ambiguous yeah. but we have an idea here and also from the other nativities that he displayed and calculated that it's it's not periphery it's 
it's another form of quadrant division that, like I said, was kind of later attributed to al Qabisi, but most likely it was Rhetorius. Um, right. Did you want to read number two? Sure. Um, so two, he goes on. I'll read ahead and then we'll trace back a little bit because I don't think two is as long. Um, mm-hmm. So, and when you have already ascertained the seven stars in respect of their places, cast the seven lots that are subjoined in the introduction of the book and ascertain the appearances of Selene, that is to say the conjunction or whole moon before birth. Her stars have enormous performance in accordance with their temperaments, especially if both of them have the same wind. Um, yes. I'm sorry. I have a different, I have a different copy. Oh my Cam. gosh. Um, I have the conjunction or whole moon before her birth, her third, seventh, and 40th days. And the application. And yeah. her applications and separations. Sorry, I need to literally practice. move this off the table because I'm looking down at it. <laughs> um, no worries. And as we said at the beginning, like there are many different translations. Right, and all these versions. The and like, these are, those are both from version one. So you can see how that was still Laszlo kind of going back and forth about translating even this same manuscript. Um, mm-hmm. so he mentions the hermetic lots here by kind of referencing, you know, the seven lots after you cast the positions of the seven planets. So we can pretty much readily assume he's referencing the seven principal hermetic lots. Yes. And he mentions they are, um, discussed in the introduction of the book. Um, that's a reference to his own text. So, and Yeah. And then he proceeds with the appearances of Selene, the conjunction or whole moon before her birth. It's her prenatal syzygy. Exactly. So, yeah, I mean, some of you guys may have seen uh, or heard of other authors talking about this point that they always looked at called the, the prenatal syzygy or the conjunction or prevention before the birth of the new moon or full moon before the birth. And it's basically just the degree of the the lunation that happened before you were born. Um, Yes. And it has something to say about the general life path of the native. Yeah. It it was, um, you know, you could look at like maybe the chart of that, of the newer full moon to read into, you know, maybe what it has to say about their life. The degree itself in the chart was also used as one of the helegical places or places of life, which basically just means that it's another one of those really important places in the chart that was given the responsibility of being able to hold the vital life force of the person or being able to um, be used in timing techniques to show information about how a person's life unfolds over time and particularly in relation to their health. Yes, definitely. Um, and then it goes on to her third, seventh, and fortieth days, which is also kind of following the same idea. Um, if you want to talk a little bit about that, Cam, feel free. Um, yeah. So they had um, they had other methods of kind of looking at understanding a little bit about the trajectory of someone's life, but also in assessing how well someone's childhood will be and determining like, you know, once we get into talking a little bit more about like the length of life calculations, looking at, you know, will this child like live, you know, uh, a few years? Cause back then that was a much more prevalent inquiry as they needed to see um, and understand, you know, how should we even go about, you know, predicting some events in this person's life if we don't know if they're going to live long enough, you know, Ptolemy has a quote, um, and I have it here and just to kind of preface or put into place, you know, that that whole reason that they consider this Ptolemy says it well, he says the consideration of the length of life takes le- the leading place among the inquiries about events following birth. For as the ancient says, it's ridiculous to attach particular predictions to one who by the constitution of the years of his life will never attain to all the time of the predicted events. So it's basically another piece of looking at that. Um, some more modern astrologers, um, or recently astrologers have tried to reconstruct this use and it's a little bit, you know, it's, a little, it's, it's kind of difficult to understand exactly how we can use it. But in the third, like they would say, look at the third day of the moon 
it's going to say something about your, your childhood or how well you'll be supported because in the third day after your birth is like when you'll begin to, you know, take your mother's nourishment. And on the seventh day is something about like maybe the, you know, mature time of your life, the middle time of your life and the 40th day, something about the quality of your death or maybe your later years of life. Right. And that concludes this first paragraph that Rhetorius has here. So we've got this humongous list of things that we should be checking out, and then it stops there. So these can be assumed to be the most like primary or fundamental considerations, mm -hmm. the first steps that you take. And then it leads into the next paragraph saying, then after setting the general fixity of the birth and the pivots, succeedance and declines to the degree, examine the domicile master of the birth according to the aforementioned methods. So these methods that he is referring to are likely referring to the original of what is now chapter 16 of the revision. Um, there, the procedure is described in Valens 3.3 is recommended. Yeah. This is Laszlo's footnote on that little mm -hmm. bit. So, yeah, Valens. And he's talking about, go ahead. Or, no, what were you going to say? I was going to say, and he's talking here about the master of the nativity. So he wants you to have all of these angles and look at the domicile master of the birth, mm -hmm. the master of the nativity. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that he's highlighting looking at the houses, the, the you know, the quadrant houses again here when he's bringing up looking at, at finding the rulers of the nativity. Because we know that especially in chapter three of Valens, in this chapter where he's talking about um, finding the masters of the nativity, the whole idea is looking at the angularity of the luminaries and trying to understand, you know, which one is the predominator or the planet in charge of holding the vital life force of the native. So basically he's just saying, you know, of the vital life force of the native and kind of encapsulating it. Now, this is a whole other discussion. So, you know, like we've said, kind of have to keep harpening that point of, we, we can't talk about everything here. This is our introduction to detailing out what we're going to be talking about on the podcast. But Valens yes, talks about this, this in 3.3 if you want to read about the predominator and the master of the nativity. Nice. And then did you want to go with four? Sure. Um, also, I just wanted to mention one more thing with the, um, the applications and separations of the moon. Um, so right after oh, the third, seventh, and 40th days, which they looked at, um, yeah, they always took into account the moon's aspects, you know, who it was last separating from and who she's applying to next. And Maternus has a really great couple of chapters in his book on delineating the effects of how, you know, when the moon's separating from, you know, Saturn and applying to Venus, you know, what that indicates about someone's kind of life trajectory as a whole, you know, considering how that changes if the moon is waxing or waning, who it's applying to and separating from. So this is another detail that they would really pay attention to, just really focusing in on the moon's aspect. Yes, definitely. I mean, it's interesting too, because like we know the moon is the fastest sphere, and so she's responsible for really anchoring into um, our lives, you know, what she's applying to next. And so whatever planet she's applying to in your chart, she's sort of responsible for anchoring energy into manifesting whatever planet she's applying to. That energy is sort of getting increasingly prominent and manifesting over time. Yes, definitely. And the moon is the body, the soul, you know. So we, we have this vessel, and the moon being the lowest sphere really speaks to that, the vessel that we have. And then um, just coming back to this next paragraph here, point four, um, then after considering and calculating the conception, so the conception chart, um, if you want to ask your parents when they think you were conceived, go right ahead. 
but <laughs> they had all of these fancy methods for calculating your conception. Um, and then that's followed by cast the leading and following trigonal, tetragonal, and hexagonal sides of every star to the degree. Note them down separately and keep them at hand. So um, this is talking about the applying and separating, right? Leading and following um, trigonal, tetragonal, and hexagonal sides. These are trines, squares, and sextiles of every planet. And it wants them to the degree. And it wants you to note them down separately in order that when, during the interpretation of the circumambulations, we are making the adherences. So keep these in mind because we're going to touch back on these degree-specific aspects, not just sign-based aspects, for a new technique that he introduces and spends a lot of time on. Yeah, because the whole idea with this so on is, and I think this is a really good exercise that everyone should sit down and do with their own chart, is to literally just write and draw out the seven lines, the seven aspects into the other seven signs and houses of your chart. Um, because particularly for this timing method that was vital to all of the ancient astrologers, they, you have to understand and really see the dynamics of which rays are falling at which degrees and how when you start to, you know, basically progress or direct or circumambulate anything degree by degree through your chart you have to pay attention to which degrees it's hitting in which successive order to denote the time lord periods so he's just saying make a really good note of those degrees and where they're falling and it's also just relevant because um when you're thinking about interpreting the houses to you know houses that like the malefics are square or opposition to for instance could also be ones that see more challenges um just by nature of the aspect that that planet sends and casts into that house Yes, definitely. And remember that aspects come from sight, spect, sight. So you are, it's not a matter, it's a matter of what can this planet see? Can this planet see its domicile? Can it see what's going on? Can it see a malefic? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. things like And all that comes into really like an important distinction when you are doing those methods because it's like, it's all about reception. So if you're, if a planet can cast its ray into its own sign or bound or house or something, when that comes into play and comes into activation through timing, it's a totally different result than if there wasn't like reception necessarily. So it's, it's, it's important to, like we said now, like look at the degree, but also maybe consider the reception, you know, is it going to aspect any of its own bounds anywhere? Cause wherever it does, those places just get lit up when it comes to activating them through their time Lord periods. Yes, definitely. Um, did you want me to, pick up where I left off or did you want to take this next little part? Um, You can keep going. Okay. And then he says, we should not only take the trigonal, tetragonal, and hexagonal sides according to the sign but also to the degree for they are more forceful, especially in the signs of short and long ascension. So he's saying that we want exact aspects because it's the difference between looking at a person versus making eye contact with a person, right? There's that degree of force. And then he goes into the signs of short and long ascension. Right. And um, yeah, Ptolemy references this in relation to the circumambulations as well, or primary directions rather as well, that based off of the ascensional time of the sign and the rate at which it ascends, um, that's actually going to affect that's made. Because if you think about it, if you're standing outside and and you're in the northern hemisphere, for instance, Virgo and Libra in particular, in particular rise, or Leo and Scorpio for that matter too in some locations, take the longest amount of time to rise. Now that's going to really slow down the quality of the aspect being made in the sky. And so this, it, this is like one of the most confusing things that he's referencing here. But basically, if you think about a short ascension sign that's rising quickly, uh, the longer the aspect it is, the faster it happens. So a trine actually acts more like a square. And with a sextile in signs of long ascension that take a long time to rise, a sextile acts more like a square. So when you consider the ascensional time of the sign and the aspect that's being made, it can shorten or lengthen the quality of the aspect that's actually made like in Mundo, like literally out in the world. 
And so that's going to affect the length of life. So a trine in signs of um, short ascension that rise quickly, a trine is actually going to be more detrimental or anoretic that could literally kill. Same thing with a sextile in the signs of long ascension, um, where it's actually lengthened a bit and becomes more like a killing square. Yes. And um, I just totally lost my thought. Totally lost my thought. Oh, yes. If you are unfamiliar with the idea of signs of short and long ascension, we actually already have an episode that covers this. So if that's something you wanted to look more into, you would not have to be patient for that one. Yeah. So we have, um, we have two episodes covering information about that. If you want to check them out, they're also kind of grouped together with the concept of Antitia and Contra Antitia. So you can go check those out. Um, and yes. then... Yeah, that brings us to the next segment. On the length of life. Right. So this is where he kind of gets a little bit further into this idea of calculating, you know, the length of life as really a primary thing. You know, this is, we haven't even talked about, you know, house rulerships, really. It's like they had calculated this first. Um, and I know we're also getting to 43. So we'll see how much more we can cover Um but I think, I, Stella, I don't know what you think, but I would like to maybe talk about that section nine where he's giving the descriptions of what each planet indicates. So if Ptolemy's quotes maybe a little bit too much, we may, what do you, maybe we could skip a little bit further because I think. I think we can definitely skip Ptolemy's quote. Yeah. Um, it's pretty straightforward, but I, I think we should just introduce number five yeah. here where it says. After noting down all of these said sides, examine the lifetime from the domicile master of the selected releaser. Yeah, but I'm just going to say real the quick, se- the releaser, that whole idea is the same thing as the predominator or the afeta or the, like the syzygy, the lot of fortune. Any of those places that in your chart are configured in a certain way where they can be qualified to be used in, in, in like this timing method, basically. Right. And so this is a question of vitality, right? Like, it's not just a matter of physical stature, character, anything like that. Like, this is your life force here. And it's saying to release from, um, examine the lifetime from the domicile master of the selected releaser. But when you are making circumambulations of of the stars, do not forget the adherences of the stars, the hour marker, the midheaven, and the lots that occur with the stars that have enormous performance in accordance with their temperaments, especially if both of them have the same wind. Right. So this is just saying, like, release from the master and from the releaser, whatever you're going to release from. But, like, don't forget to release from your ascendant, your midheaven, your other planets, yeah. lots, stuff like that. Like, you cannot ignore all of these things because... All of these things, as we will see in section nine that we're about to read on, um, are very, very important. Yeah, it's really crazy because it sounds like I know it sounds like so much, but, you know, he's really indicating their procedure here. So we have to think about and consider how these things are being affected in just this, you know, timing technique, which is just the first one that he introduces. But, you know, for a good reason, because ultimately with circumambulations, they're going to denote the most important, you know, larger periods that then kind of get modified in smaller expressions through like annual perfections. We can narrow down those multi-year periods into more specific segments. So, you know, if this is all kind of a lot, it's like basically we're just thinking about, you know, we're, we look at these important places and according to this, you know, timing procedure where you're basically moving things at a certain rate through each sign it's going to encounter these aspects that we've talked about plotting out. Um, So for instance, if your sun, say it's at like 10 degrees of Cancer, and you have Mars at 15 degrees of Libra, we're going to release your sun, okay, that's this idea of circumambulating or moving it through the degrees. And according to the rate that is being used in the timing method, there's kind of various discussions about which rate is um, the one to use. And it varies depending on your physical location on the right. globe, worth mentioning. Yeah. Um, then, you know, when that sun hits 15 Cancer, when it moves five degrees ahead, it's, for instance, going to meet that square with Mars. And that's going to explain something about what's the quality of what will happen 
say, you know, five years roughly ish, 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 um, when your son, you know, reaches that aspect. So we're considering the aspects, right. we're considering them from all of these places in the chart. And then you actually do, you write out these periods, you calculate them. And then, you know, these are telling us about, in reference to these topics, what is going on. And so now in nine, where we're going to skip ahead a little bit, he's going to explain, well, releasing from this thing tells you about this, releasing from this one tells you about this. So in chapter or uh, section nine here, after really quickly, um, I do want to say we're probably going to go through section nine a little bit quickly. Um, but it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, they are a little, it's pretty straightforward. So if you know the significations of the planets, this shouldn't be too out of the ordinary, really. Mm-hmm. So he says, after examining the matter of the lifetime, even if there should be not found a domicile master beside the releaser, um, don't worry about that. Um, yeah. <laughs> basically, it's just saying sometimes you have to play around with which planet is holding the life force. It can be a little bit tricky and they didn't always explain it a hundred percent with a hundred percent clarity but basically you're still going to release everything no matter what but certain things get assigned certain roles and sometimes they don't work out like it's supposed to and that's when it just gets fun because we don't really have like a specific um, explanation of what to do in those cases but he's saying regardless examine the circumambulation of the hour marker so the ascendant the midheaven the lot of fortune helios the sun Selene, the moon, and the remaining five stars. So that gives us the angles, the lot of fortune, and the seven planets. And now he goes off to say what they indicate. So for the circumambulation of the hour marker, indicates the reckoning about life and the physical ailments, and the circumambulation of the midheaven indicates the reckoning about activity, reputation, livelihood, and children. Interesting. The circumambulation of Helios indicates the reckoning about reputation, honor, high rank, fathers, rulers, higher positions, or older brothers. Um, That of Selene indicates ailments of the body, companionships, mothers, mistresses, and older sisters. That of the lot of fortune indicates good luck and honor or loss and fine resulting from acquisitions and the ailments of the body. This one, um, I do want to say there is a footnote there that says accidental ailments of the body, Mm -hmm. which I think is significant. Like, an ailment that you have that is just bad fortune Mm -hmm. bad luck you know yeah um that kind of idea of you know those things that just happen to you right like your body you know you just get sick sometimes or you just you know break something um chronos indicates destructions of things injuries ailments misfortune grandfathers or fathers older brothers gains or losses from inheritance that one's that one's a big thing with chronos a lot of them talk about chronos having to deal with like your wealth and personal acquisition and land and estate um, in circumambulation. So definitely look to Kronos in terms of like your larger financial assets and purchases. Um, Mm -hmm. Zeus. Oh yeah. uh, Oh, I was, can I read? Oh, sure. Okay. If you want to know, yeah, you just finish it off. Okay. Okay. And then the circumambulation of Zeus indicates honors, gains, acquaintance with people of high rank, patronages, and beneficial acquisitions of Aries, it indicates military services, public affairs, temerity, punishments, confusions, unexpected conflicts, ardent affections, and wounds caused by iron or falling. Then, the circumambulations of Aphrodite, happy Aphrodite day, indicates marriage, friendships, erotic love, intercourses, prosperity, gains or losses from women, mothers, and younger sisters. And finally, the circumambulation of Hermes indicates younger brothers, education, commerce, servants, and freedmen. So, okay, I think we could probably leave it there. Um, So that was pretty much his initial exposition on plotting the planets, where are they sitting, who are they being ruled by, how are they talking to each other, looking at little things with the fixed stars, calculating houses, you know, by their quadrant division. He talks about paying attention to some lunar concepts like the days of the moon, um, the application. Kind of talking about the length of life next with finding the releasers, the planets that are planets or points that are given that power of holding the life force. And then he gets into talking a little bit about, you know, make, making note of the aspect degrees they make, um, 
you know, paying attention to short and long ascension, how that affects the severity of the kind of aspect. And then also we skipped ahead a little bit and then talked about, you know, what circumambulating each of those points will indicate. Yes. And then in this very last paragraph here, um, he repeats himself a little bit, but he does add um, to look at the ascending and descending nodes. So the north and south node, as well as the quality of the bounds that the planets fall into. He kind of touched on that like super early on. But then he talks about the planetary years as well. So the periods of the stars according to the greatest, middle, and minor years. First by making days, then months, and finally years. And that's all, folks. <laughs> so, yeah, that was our rapid exposition on Rotorius's excerpt here. So if anyone, we can uh, do questions for a little bit here. If anyone has wants to raise their hand or come up and speak or do rapid-fire questions, we can do our best to get them all in. So... Hop in here now, and we'll have a few minutes, because I'm presenting in a few minutes, so I, I do have to run, unfortunately. I'd love to stay in chat. But, yeah. I will say, too, um, if you don't want to, like, verbally speak, you can hit the little comment button in the bottom right-hand corner and type out your question in the thread, and then we can answer it that way as oh, well. Yes. Thank you again, Shai, for mentioning that. Well... Yeah, Alrighty, I mean, so thank you. Oh, here we go. Okay. Hey, Amani. Hello. Hey there, can you hear us? Yeah, Amani? Hi. Um, I love this. Like, I love that you guys, um, that Rictorious was, I think that's how you pronounce their name. I joined late, sorry. Um, about the circumambulations, love that content. I just wanted to um, ask again about the, what he said about the ascendant. Did you say something about our reckoning? Um, which section of the um, document were you looking at? Um, when you were uh, talking about like releasing from different, I think, planets or points, you started with the ascendant. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, he uses the translation. He translates, indicates the reckoning about life and the physical elements. Um, yeah, I know. I would be curious to see the Greek there. Um, I'm, I'm, I have a feeling that it's some kind of indicator of like the whole reckoning about life, like just the whole shebang, because that's really what the directing the ascendant can give you is a really broad indication of kind of the most important things that are happening, happening and changing in your life, um, unless it's maybe a little bit more of a negative concept, context of, of the, that Greek word that he's translating. And it might be something a little bit more pertaining specifically to like those physical, you know, maladies that might come from what the ascendant will show. But yeah, beyond that, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. I'll have to look up at the Greek, but I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you about that if, if I can find that. Did that answer your question? Um, yeah, thanks. Mostly, yeah. And you did miss the beginning, so you might have heard it, you might have missed us say this. Um, but we are doing a whole Mercurian series on Rhetorius mm. and the different things that he says about his work. So we'll definitely be coming back to this. Um, yeah. Oh, is that on your um, YouTube channel? Yes. Um, the. Oh host right. of this yeah the host of this twitter space is our twitter page um if you want to give us a follow every time we upload a video we tweet about it um we've been on just a little bit of a hiatus life has been pretty busy but we're definitely planning on coming back to that very soon all right that's great i'm looking forward to that awesome Alrighty, everybody. Well, if there are no other questions, I'm not seeing any in this thread. Um, I think it's time that we close the space. One last call for questions, comments, concerns. Yeah, all right. Well, I think we'll call it because I do have to run. So thank you everyone so much for coming out and 
If you want to hear more about the 12 parts, you guys can stick around and hop into my space right after this. So thank you guys so much. And hopefully we'll see you around more this weekend. Yes. Thank you all. Have a great all right, one. Bye-bye.